Hey Biology 400, this is Mr. Gales. We have uh, a new unit that we're beginning now. The unit is going to be called Exploring the Cellular Basis of Life. And in this unit we're going to be learning all about cells, cell structures, and how they work to maintain homeostasis and allow for all of the processes that make life possible. This is screencast session number one. Uh, before we get started, please make sure that you've got your paper that you can do your two column notes on. Let me remind you that two column notes, the main idea goes on the left hand side of your paper and then on the right hand side you're going to record definitions and details, examples, um, any additional information that I'm describing as I talk about the main idea that uh, seems critical to aid your understanding. Okay, Please make sure that you have that and you're ready to go now. Now one new thing that you're going to see here on this screen uh, Mr. Workman and I have decided to include the learning targets for these screencast sessions. This gives you an idea of what you should be listening for, what you should be paying special attention to, and ultimately what you should be able to do. So this screencast, obviously, is, as you can tell by looking at the first learning target, is going to focus on something called cell theory. You should be able to list the three parts of cell theory. Cell theory is a major biological theory that was developed over the course of a few hundred years. Uh, there were some scientists that were involved in developing that, so you should be able to describe the contributions of Robert Hooke, Robert Brown, Theodor Schwann, Matthias Schleiden, Louis Pasteur, and Rudolf Virchow to cell theory. Those are the major scientists that we describe as the, the developers of this theory. You should be able to discuss the importance of cell theory in understanding the structure and function of living things, and you should be able to discuss the importance of cell theory in understanding the evolutionary relationship between all organisms. In this screencast there are going to be two embedded videos that I'm going to jump out of the presentation and play. The videos help to sort of uh, frame the material that we're going to be learning about here. You don't need to do notes during the videos, but just watch and pay attention. Um, I'll try to do a recap uh, on the video and sort of point out what the major ideas are as we get going. All right, and actually this is the first video that we're going to play. I'm going to jump out of this screen and go over to my window here, and I'm going to open up uh, this video so we can play that. The diversity of life on Earth is astounding. Organisms both large and small have adapted to the many different habitats on the planet. And along the way, they have developed unique traits and methods of survival. But at a microscopic level, all living organisms are very similar. They are all made of cells. A single cell contains the information that determines all an organism's characteristics. A giant sequoia in California begins as a single cell and eventually grows to be one of the largest trees in the world. As the fundamental unit of life, the structure and function of cells dictate many of the basic behaviors of living organisms. Animals eat because their cells need energy, and they breathe because their cells need oxygen. Cells are able to function and thrive on their own. Unicellular organisms are so successful that they can be found in every habitat on Earth, no matter how extreme. Without cells, life as we know it would not exist. Life on Earth is diverse but it all can be traced to a single building block, the cell. All the requirements of life can be traced to what cells need to survive. By understanding the structure and function of cells and the differences between types of cells, we have a better understanding of the world around us. All right, so in that video, we really focus on the idea that all living things, even though they may be very diverse, very different, really all are built on the same fundamental unit, which is the cell. The cell is capable, the individual cell is capable of carrying out all of the functions of life that really define what it means to be alive. Those would include the ability to grow and develop, the ability to take in uh, a usable energy form, generally chemical energy, and then convert that into energy for work. 
would include the ability to reproduce and adapt to the environment. Cells are capable of all of those. Okay, now the first main idea that you need to record here is cell theory. It's not underlined, but this is in fact the main idea for this slide. Modern cell theory uh, is, in, in its modern uh, form, includes three major tenets, and we're going to go through these three tenets one at a time right now. The first tenet of cell theory is that all living things are made of one or more cells. Essentially what this means for us is if we find uh, something on this planet that we believe is alive but we're not sure, the first test that we could use to determine that would be whether or not that, that particular object is made out of cells. Living things, as our current definition understands it, living things have to be made of cells. There is no smaller unit of life. Uh, the second major tenet of cell theory is that cells are the basic units of structure and function in all organisms. Students sometimes have a difficult time understanding what that means, so let me break that down for you. Uh, take a, an entire living thing like yourself. If we were to break you apart into all of your basic parts, the smallest basic unit of you that is still living is the cell. Uh, and not only is that the most basic unit, but it, it's capable of doing all of the major functions of life, as I discussed in the, at the end of the previous video. So another way of saying the second tenet is that the cell is the smallest unit of life. It's the smallest unit capable of sustaining life. All right, and the third tenet of modern cell theory is that all cells arise from existing cells or from pre-existing cells. And this is important for us in understanding the evolutionary importance of cell theory. If we can understand that all cells arise from existing cells, then we know that all cells today had to trace their ancestry back to a common ancestor at some point in time. The, the pictures that you see on this slide are drawings that were done by some of the major scientists involved in the development of cell theory. The major picture that you see here is a sketch that was made by a scientist named Robert Hooke as he was viewing cork cells. Now the next slide here, this is a, a link to the video that I'm going to play next. This is a, a video called A Brief History of Cells and it looks at the major scientists that were involved in the development of cell theory and sort of the contributions that they made along the way. Uh, it's kind of a funny little video. It's a recreation of these scientists and their major, the major uh, moments in their development of cell theory. These are microscopic animals and plants. Rather than being made of many cells, they simply exist as single cells on their own. These images have been magnified hundreds of times. The single cells are so small that you can't normally see them. It was only with the invention of the microscope, just over 300 years ago, that creatures like this became visible. Before then, no one knew that cells existed. Ah. <laughs> you know, the closer you look at things, the more amazing they seem to get. If I hold this piece of cork in my hand, it has a definite shape. describe the room light structures inside his piece of cork. He spent many hours carefully drawing their honeycomb pattern. Although Hook gave cells their name, nobody knew what they were or even what they did. To find out more about cells, scientists had to be able to see in more detail. But the early microscopes of the 1600s just weren't good enough. It was 150 years before better lenses were crafted and a clearer picture became possible. 
1833, one of the leading botanists of the time was Scotsman Robert Brown. Having travelled the world and collected hundreds of plants, he made a startling discovery. There are so many plants, all of them so different, except, except when I look at the floor so Every plant is made up of cells, and inside every cell there is a sort of dark, dense blob. Whichever plant I choose, it's always the same. I can find not one single exception. Robert Brown called the blob-like structure inside each cell the nucleus. About this time, scientists were beginning to realise that all living things were made of cells. Now this next one you guys are going to like, a few the two Germans. Later, in 1839, two German scientists, Dr. Schwann and Dr. Schleiden, came up with a theory which was to change the way scientists came to the living world. Dr. Schwann? Yeah, Dr. Schleiden. That's them. We have discovered something completely amazing. The material inside the cell moves about. Very slowly, I grant you, but still, she moves. We can only conclude one thing from them. You mean? Yeah, the cells are alive. <coughs> Sometimes a single cell exists on its own. But more complex creatures like you or I are made up of millions of living cells, all working together. All living things are made of cells, no matter how big or small, like a plant. Even this fly. Yeah. The theory they eventually came up with was that cells are the basic building blocks of life. From then on, science has never looked back. As better microscopes have been developed, our view of the world has changed, and scientists have been able to look at small things in more and more detail. This pinhead has been magnified by a modern electron microscope. Instead of making the pin hundreds of times bigger, it magnifies it thousands of times. At an even greater magnification, the speckles on the pin can be seen to be tiny bacteria, very simple single cells. That's an example. The image that you just saw was an example of an electron microscope, specifically a scanning electron microscope that was used to view the surface features of that um, pin. You might have noticed that the tip of the pin didn't look very sharp, when we look at that at, at such a, a microscopic view, we can see the, all the little imperfections in the metal. All the little speckles on that pin were the cells, the bacterial cells. Okay, we're going to move along and uh, building off of the video that we just watched, we'll talk a little bit about the development of cell theory. Um, we have really the, the sort of the person who's considered the father of cell biology or the, the one who is most recognized as discovering the cell is Robert Hooke. So that's the next main idea. Robert Hooke was an English biologist working in the mid-1600s. Uh, in 1663 he begins doing some observations of plant material under a new microscope that he had developed. Uh, he had learned about the microscopes produced by Anton von Leeuwenhoek and he figured that he could improve them by making a slightly better lens. Uh, just was a development in terms of how the lenses were produced. What Robert Hooke was able to do, and you can see a picture of Robert Hooke down here, Robert Hooke uh, with this improved microscope was able to look at lots of different plant specimens and, and most famously he observed cork, which is the, the remaining tissue left over after the remainder of the plant cell has died off. Uh, he discovers, and you can see the drawing that he did here, he discovered that that plant was made up of lots of repetitive little units that he called cells. And he names them cells because they remind him of all the little rooms that monks lived in in monasteries. You have to remember in the 1600s that the monastery would have been one of the key features of any major village. 
And so most people would have been familiar with the, the idea of the monastic cell that the monks lived in. They looked to him just like these little simple rooms that monks lived in. So that's Robert Hooke. And, um, you know, obviously this is important because it, it gives a name to this important component that, that plants seem to be made of. Uh, but it was a while uh, before there was another major development in cell theory. The next major development comes when we get the work of a, a Scottish biologist, actually a Scottish botanist named Robert Brown. And we can see a picture of Robert Brown here. He's working in the late 1700s and the beginning of the 1800s. And he's looking at lots of different kinds of plant material. And he's using, obviously, a, a better microscope, a microscope that has greater magnification power. And he sees that in the central part of every one of these plant cells that there is a, a dense, what he calls, blob. Uh, he names that the nucleus, sort of the central region of that cell. This is really important because this is the first time that we've identified a, a true structure within uh, a cell. Now, working at, at roughly the same time, a little bit later than Robert Brown, we have our next major uh, cell biology scientist, Theodor Schwann. Now, he's a German. He's a zoologist, so he studies animals. And he's working in, in roughly the 1830s. Uh, and he, he's examining all different kinds of animal tissue. And he sees that no matter what kind of animal he looks at, no matter what kind of sample he looks at, that all of these animals' bodies appear to be made up of these individual little units called cells that Robert Hooke had identified. Uh, Theodor Schwann, by the way, an easy way for you to remember that he studies animals and states that all animals are made of cells is his last name, Schwann, is actually the German word that we use for swan in the German language. And a swan is an animal. So Theodor Schwann says that all animals are made of cells. Now, at a, roughly the same time, also in Germany, we have a, a German botanist named Matthias Schleiden. And uh, this is also about the 1830s. And, and he was probably familiar with Theodor Schwann's work. They probably read each other's uh, research in scientific papers. And so Schleiden is working on a very similar type of research, except he's a botanist, so he's looking at plants. And he, he is able to come to the conclusion that all plants are made up of these units called cells as well. And this was a really important uh, breakthrough. Interestingly, Schleiden is responsible for discovering something that you guys will probably see when we do our cell biology lab in this unit, and that is something called cytoplasmic streaming. As he's observing all of these plant cells, he notices that the material inside the plant is moving around. It's called cytoplasmic streaming. And the idea of cytoplasmic streaming is it helps to move around the nutrients and the raw materials necessary for photosynthesis so they can be utilized uh, maximally um, given the conditions necessary for photosynthesis. So it's a little bit of interesting uh, background on Matthias Schleiden. So Schleiden and Schwann, both Germans working at roughly the same time in Germany, they, they had learned about each other's work and they began working together to construct this notion of cell theory. And they really came up with the first two tenets of that, that all living things were made of cells and that uh, the, the basic units of all life forms are cells. Uh, again, Schleiden is the, the botanist studying plants and Schwann is the zoologist studying animals. So that would uh, tie in the idea that all living things are made up of these cells. Now, the next major uh, scientist that we need to talk about is someone who you may have been familiar with. Uh, this is the 1860s, roughly, and we have a French uh, biologist and chemist named Louis Pasteur, and he's working with bacteria. His major work was actually designed to try to combat illness, uh, uh, illness that is caused by the, sp the spread of germs and pathogens. The way we know Louis Pasteur today is through the process name for him, which is called pasteurization. For instance, milk, before it's sold to us, is pasteurized. That means that it's flash heated. It's heated up very quickly and that kills off any bacteria living in it that can cause infection. And then of course it's cooled down to prevent the growth of that bacteria. And the important thing about Louis Pasteur, and I'll show you a picture of Louis Pasteur here, the important thing about Louis Pasteur and his work, uh, he was trying to disprove the idea of spontaneous generation, which is the, the was a fairly common uh, notion that living things were able to be generated from non-living material. An example of spontaneous generation would be when there was a very heavy rain, people would notice that there would be worms all over the, the streets or the sidewalks. So they believed that rain made worms. 
Now today we can rationally explain that, that when it, there's a very heavy rain, the ground becomes saturated with water and the worms have to come up out of the ground or they, they essentially drown in their tunnels. Another example of spontaneous generation would be that people would see maggots forming on rotting meat and they thought that the rotting meat produced the maggots. What we actually know today is that flies will come along and eat some of that meat and as they are there eating the meat they're laying their eggs and then the eggs generate uh, the maggots. So in any case Louis Pasteur was working with uh, nutrient broth that he was uh, essentially growing in large flasks that he could seal off. And he, ge he demonstrated that if you boiled this, this broth and then sealed the flask so nothing could get into it, that there was no life within that, that nutrient broth. He essentially showed that that spontaneous generation was not possible. He did, however, show that if you broke the flask or if you opened the seal on the flask and allowed air to come in, that then you could get the generation of living things. So he, he then extended his idea and said that not only... Um, does spontaneous generation not happen? But those, those, the the growth of new life within that medium must be responsible, or or be the work of uh, microscopic organisms that we can't see. So Louis Pasteur disproving the idea that living things come from non-living things is important because it stimulates the work of our next scientist, Rudolf Virchow, and we see a picture of him here. Rudolf Virchow was a German pathologist, which means he was studying. Um, the progression of illness or disease in the body. And during the course of his research, he observed lots of different kinds of cells, and he would see that cells were actually dividing. And he stated after lots of research that all cells come from pre-existing cells. In other words, he, never did he see an instance where cells just spontaneously arose out of non-living matter. He always saw one cell leading into another cell. So those are the scientists really responsible for the development of cell theory. What we're going to look at next is the importance of cell theory. So this is your next main idea. There are really two major ways that cell theory is important. One is helping us to understand the relationship between structure and function in a living thing. And then ultimately, the, the, the second reason that it's important is it helps us to understand the evolutionary relationship between all living things. Now in this slide, what we see is uh, the idea that the cell is the simplest structural and functional unit of life. There are no smaller subdivisions of a cell or organism that by itself is considered alive. So when we take this picture, we have a, a baby, the smallest unit of that, of that child that is still living is the cell. It's the basic structural unit of life. And so from that, we can understand that the organism structure and all of its functions are ultimately due to the activities of its cells, since those are the building blocks. When we look at the entire organism, we know that we're composed of many different systems. In this case, this is the digestive system. The digestive system is made up of many organs, like here we have the stomach. The organ is made up of tissues, which are a group of cells that do similar jobs related to that, the functioning of that organ. Here we have lining on the inside of the stomach. And then the tissue itself is composed of individual cells. So we really move from the, the higher order, the entire organism, all the way down to that basic structure called the cell. Now you might be asking here, why aren't these structures down here part of this discussion? Well, uh, an organelle is a part that's found inside a cell that does a specific job, but the organelle by itself is not considered to be alive. It does not It does not meet all of the requirements of life. And obviously a macromolecule like a DNA molecule itself is also not capable of all of the functions of life. But the cell is. So the cell is the basic unit. All right. Now the, the final um, idea here for this screencast in terms of the importance for cell theory is understanding this idea that cells come from pre-existing cells and not from non-living matter. If we understand that, and if we can experimentally show that, which uh, Louis Pasteur did, Rudolf Virchow did, and then obviously hundreds of scientists since then, if we understand that one cell becomes two cells, becomes four, and so on through this process of cell division, we can then deduce that all life traces its ancestry to the same original cells. I mean, it makes sense if we can see one cell dividing into two cells. We know that those two cells originally came from this single cell we can just trace it backwards. All living things today can trace their ancestral line to the same original cells. Now because of this common ancestry, when we look at cells of species that may be quite different, 
we still see many fundamental similarities in their chemical composition and in their metabolic mechanisms. So this picture that I just brought up shows us an animal cell, a plant cell, and a bacterial cell. Bacterial cells are also known as prokaryotic cells. Uh, animal and plant cells are both examples of what are called eukaryotic cells. And you can see that they're very different. We know plant cells and animal cells are quite different. Plant cells are capable of doing photosynthesis. They contain structures called chloroplasts. Uh, animal cells lack those. They don't have that ability. Uh, bacterial cells look quite different. You can see that they have a completely different structure. They lack a nucleus. But because they're all related through that evolutionary lineage, they all trace their, their origins back to the same ancestral cells, we would expect to see lots of fundamental similarities in terms of their overall structure and in the, the way their metabolism or their chemical reactions work. So when we look at these cells, all of these cells, even though they're very different, they all contain cytoplasm, which is the fluid of the cell. They all contain a membrane, which is the outer boundary of the cell. They all contain ribosomes, which are the cellular parts that make proteins, and they all contain genetic material in the form of DNA or chromosomes. So there are lots of differences, but because of their common ancestry, we also have lots of similarities. The cells of any type of organisms, uh, diverse organisms, are going to be very, very similar, and that allows us to study a, a branch of biology known as cell biology. We can generalize the basic structures of a cell because of that ancestral uh, path. And that really is uh, the importance of cell theory and, and the, the tenet of cell theory that states that all cells come from pre-existing cells. So that wraps up screencast session number one. Please make sure that if you have any questions about what we talked about in this screencast that you've written them down and that you can bring them into class with you. Uh, in class when we get back to uh, cell biology we'll be looking at lots of different kinds of cells and we'll be applying what we learned here with cell theory. So that's all for now. We'll see you next time in biology.